Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this video we're going to talk about section 3.3 which works with a little bit of the properties of functions and some of the things we can look for when we're dealing with polynomial functions. Uh, the first thing that we should be somewhat familiar with is intercepts. When we were looking for the y-intercept, we essentially set x equal to 0 and find a y-intercept. Now notice it's singular. There's only one y-intercept. If there were more than one, we wouldn't have a function. We wouldn't be working with something that would pass the vertical line test as we had discussed before. Um, also, or in function notation, you notice we have when x is 0, the function evaluated at 0. So we can write it in function notation as well. But one thing we always have to be aware of when dealing with functions is the value x equal to 0 in the domain. If not, then we don't have a y-intercept. So, so if we are looking for a y-intercept, x equal to 0 has to be within the domain of the function. The other intercept that we can find, or intercepts, is the x-intercept. That's where we set the function equal to 0 and find any solutions. Now, there might be multiple solutions. We might have no intercepts. We might have one, two, three, or even more, depending on the degree of the polynomial. So we should be familiar with how to find the intercepts. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to recall something from chapter 2, section 2, when we talked about symmetry. We're going to use the tool of symmetry to uh, determine if a function is even or odd. Now, an even function has symmetry with the y-axis. And essentially what we do, if, if we change the value of x from a positive value to a negative value, do we get the same value of y out? Which means on either side of the y-axis, we have a value negative x, positive y, positive x, positive y. We get the same value of y no matter if x is positive or negative. That tells us it's symmetric with the y-axis. Now, we could have symmetry with the origin, as we discussed in section 2.2. When we put in a value x, we get out a value y. When we put in a negative x, we get out a negative value y. In the graph here, if we have this value here through the origin, we have the same value except the signs change for x and y. So there's a sign change for both of them. So if we review, when we put in a negative x and we get out the same function we started with, that tells us it's symmetric with y. That also tells us that it's an even function. So we get two bits of information from doing our test for symmetry. In this example here, f of negative x equals negative f of y. Well, that means if we put in a negative value of x, it changes the entire function to a negative, changes all the terms sign. That tells me it's symmetric with the origin. So if I have a value in the uh, second quadrant, I'm going to have a value in the fourth quadrant with those same uh, values except a different sign. And then we have symmetry with the x-axis, which we discussed in 2.2. Uh, the thing about that is if it's symmetric with the x-axis, as you can see here in the illustration, it wouldn't pass the vertical line test, so it's not a function. When it comes to something like that, we're really not going to worry about it because we're looking at the properties of functions. This would not be a function. All right, let's look at the next board here. To actually look at an example of determining if a function is even, odd, or neither, because if it's not even or if it's not odd, then it has to be neither. What we'll find is if it's one, it's not the others. So it can only be one or the other, not both. So let's look at this function. We have f of x equals x plus 1 over x. Well, we could do the same thing we did before to test for symmetry. It'll tell us if it's even, odd, or neither. So if I want to test for symmetry, I'm just going to plug in and evaluate the function for a negative value of x. And if I do that, I get negative x here plus 1 over a negative x there. And if I do a little simplifying, I say, hey, both of these terms change sign. Let's factor out that negative. And just assess for a moment, how did this change the function? Well, all it did was turn it to a negative. So it's the same as negative f of x. 
So essentially what we have here is we can now determine if this is an even function, odd function, or neither. Well, if I put in a negative value of x and got out the negative of the function, that tells me that it's symmetric with the origin, which means it's an odd function. So we have an odd function here. Now, it's not even because the case wasn't where we put in a negative x and got the exact same value out. This is different. This is a negative times the function. All right, <clears throat> let's look at some different types of functions we might come across. One is the constant function. And we should be familiar with that. It's essentially the equation of a horizontal line, in this case, y equals some number b. 0b would be our intercept. It doesn't increase or decrease. It stays constant. We can also write that in function notation, where the function equals a constant. Uh, what this means is over any interval from a to b, from left to right for any value of x, no matter what I evaluate it at, whether it's a or b, it's going to be the same. It's never going to change. That's why we call it the constant function. An increasing function. Now, when we look at different functions and different curves, sometimes they go up, sometimes it goes down. So we want to determine, is the function increasing or decreasing over some interval? Well, if we look at this as we look at it from left to right, from some value of x being a and some value of x being b, as we move left to right, that's why a is less than b on our graph, it's going upwards in y. y is increasing. So what that means is if we evaluate a function at some value of x, and as we move to the right, this value is smaller than the next value, which means as we move left to right on the graph, the function is increasing in y. So we call this an increasing function. Now, let's look at another example. What about a decreasing function? Using the same property of a to b, moving left to right on our graph, we see the function is going down. y is decreasing or getting more negative. Well, again, we're moving left to right, so this value of x is less than the next value of x. The value that we first evaluated at, f of a, our y value, is greater than f of b. As we move further down the x-axis, our y values are decreasing. This one is bigger than that one. So we can see that this function is decreasing over some interval from a to b. Now, we write these in interval notation. So let's actually look at an example and see how, how we apply this. Here I have the function uh, parabola of some x squared function. We can see, oh, this is an even function. It's symmetric with y. What intervals is it increasing or decreasing? Well, if we move from left to right, we notice the graph is decreasing in y until we get to the origin here. So it's decreasing because this arrow is going all the way to infinity, from negative infinity to x to 0, this function is decreasing in y. So it's decreasing function. Now notice I didn't include 0, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. An increasing function, well, once we get to this point, our origin, and to the right, this function is increasing in y. So we say over the interval, from x equal to 0 all the way to infinity, this function is going to increase in y. So it's increasing over that interval. So what happens at x equals to 0? <clears throat> well, if you're moving on to uh, higher maths, maybe calculus is in your future, this is an important concept we have to understand. This is where the slope, or the average rate of change, or whatever you want to call it at this point in math, is decreasing here. Well, when it, when it gets to 0, it's not increasing or decreasing. Okay, So at this value, we can't include it. Because what's happening at 0, it's not decreasing, nor is it increasing. So it's neither at this point. So we have to keep that concept in mind. This is where it changes from decreasing to increasing. And that's why we do not include any one particular point. So I have parentheses instead of brackets because it's not increasing or decreasing at that value. All right, let's look at another example here. Here I have some piecewise function. Or, well, I should have qualified the question first. Is this a function? 
Well, we can test it by using the vertical line test. And it only intersects at once no, where, no matter where I put a vertical line. So yes, this is a function. With a function, we should always determine its domain. Well, the domain value, well, what's the, the lowest x value? If I look here, it, it's negative 3. And it includes that value. I see a solid dot here. And it goes to positive 5. And again, a solid dot, so it includes that value. So that's my domain. These are the values where I will, of x where I will find some piece of the graph. The range, as we recall, is the lowest y value to the highest y value. Well, if I look at this, this is lowest in y. And it looks to be at negative 4. And again, it's a solid dot, so I include it with a bracket. And it, its highest point looks to be positive 2 all the way up here. And there are several locations where it's 2, but 2 is the highest value. If we want to determine over what intervals is this function here increasing or decreasing, or where is it constant, well, let's just look at where it's increasing. Where is the y increasing as we move left to right? Well, from an x value of 3 to an x value of 1, this function is increasing. So we're going to say from 3, oh, excuse me, negative 3 to positive 1, the function's increasing. My y values are getting greater. Where is it decreasing? Well, if I look from this value here, which looks to be positive 3, to positive 5, my y values are decreasing. It's going down. So we're going to say from 3 to 5, we can say this is a decreasing function over this interval. And notice again, I didn't include the points. Because what is it actually doing here? Well, there's nothing below it, so I can't say it's increasing or decreasing at this point, And that's why it's not included. All right, <clears throat> where is the constant function? Or where is the function constant, excuse me? If we look from 1 to 3, there is no increase up or down. It is staying constant. So from x equals 1 to 3, the function isn't changing in y. It's staying constant. So that's how we assess a function, even if it's just a piece of function. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is local extrema values. When we have higher order polynomials, sometimes we want to determine what's the highest value over a particular interval, or what's the lowest value. Now, if we look at this, we call our highest value a local maximum or our lowest value, a local minimum, over some interval. So let's just assess this from left to right. If I see this value right here, over some interval, this is the highest point. The highest point is a maximum. The maximum refers to the value in y where it is the highest. So the local maximum for this here would be y equal to whatever. Some value, we'll just call it. A. We'll call this value A. And that occurs at some point, which we'll get to shortly. What if I want to find other local maximum? And that's why we call them local, because over this location, we have a maximum. And maybe over some other location, maybe over an interval here, we can see, hey, this value is also a maximum over some interval. And it, let's see what that is. Let's just call it B for now at y equals b. Now, when we ask for a maximum or minimum, we're looking for the y value. We have to make sure we recall that. We're not just looking for the point. All right, what about local minimums? Well, if I see over this interval, this looks like the lowest spot on the graph over this interval, the low spot, where it's changing from decreasing to increasing. That's where we're going to find a local minimum. And as I should have said over here, as it's increasing to decreasing, that's where we're going to find a local maximum. So let's look at this minimum. Let's call its y value some point c. So y equals c. That is the local minimum value, the y value. And if we notice here, we have another uh, local minimum over some interval. And maybe let's call that oh, d. 
So these would just be numbers, but for now we're saying this is a local maximum, A and B, and local minimum, C and D, are the Y values. Now they occur at different X values, right? Maybe this is, we'll call this X1, we'll call this X2, we'll call this X3, and this one right here, X4. These are the values at which local minimum or maximum occur, but they are not the local minimum or maximum value. It's just where they occur. So we, we, we want to know the difference between the maximum and minimum. These are actually asking us for y values. If you're asked to find a local maximum, you're going to state, why is this value? All right. And if it asks, well, where does this maximum or minimum occur, you'll say, at this x value. All right, so here's your quiz for this lecture video. Using a graphing utility, and if you're not familiar with your calculator, they all come with a big book. You can uh, dive into that book and maybe find some of the uh, abilities of your calculator. Hopefully, you are somewhat familiar with it. If you have a Texas instrument, uh, you can actually find video tutorials that explain how to use all the functions of a calculator. Uh, and you can find some real nice videos at hotmath.com slash graphing underscore calculators. And you can choose your TEI instrument and actually look at different videos where you can find uh, local maximums, local minimums. It also tells you how to find the zeros or the x-intercepts. Um, you can do all kinds of things with your calculator. And for the cost of these calculators, hopefully they do more, right? So your quiz today is to take the function f of x equals negative 2 minus 0.3x minus 0.5x squared plus 0.9x cubed and find the local extrema. Find the minimum or maximum values. Now keep in mind you're looking for y values. Also, look for the intervals of increasing and decreasing. So write out those intervals as well. All right, so Try it on your own. Get familiar with your calculator. Know how to find those values. There are functions where you can just find local minimum or find local maximum, and it's really easy in your function, or that function in your calculator. When the functions get kind of ugly, you know, we notice we have some decimals. They're not going to be nice integer values. So try that for yourself. All right, the next thing we're going to take a look at is a little bit review from section 3.1. What was that word? Yeah, 3.1. Average rate of change. And if we recall the average rate of change, we redefined it in 3.1 and called it the difference quotient. Now, the difference quotient is nothing more than slope. Slope is the change in y over the change in x, and we know this formula. Well, we redefine it using function notation for an x value and some other x value that we're calling h down the line, right? h units away. So <clears throat> if we recall this illustration, this was also in 3.1. If we have some value of x at c and some value of x at x, we can find these points as a function. Well, we want to find the average rate of change of these points. Now, using the notation of c, we have if c is my input, f of c is my output, my x and y values. If x is my input, f of x is my output. And we can see we can find the average rate of change just by finding the uh, y2 value, or f of x, minus the y1 value, which is f of c, and then finding the difference in x, the change in x, x minus c, this value minus that value. As long as x isn't equal to c, because then we'd have 0 in our denominator, it's undefined. All right, so let's actually see an example of that. Here we have f of x equals x squared. So we recognize this function as being a parabola, right? It's one of our library functions. We're asked to find the average rate of change from x equals 1 to x equals 2. Well, the average rate of change is just the difference quotient, which we know as slope. So let's actually find this using this function, x squared. Well, f of 2 is going to give me 4. So f of 2 is 4. Minus f of 1, so I'm finding change in y, f of 1, well, 1 squared is 1, over the change in x, 2 minus 1, 
And if we simplify this, 4 minus 1 is 3, and 2 minus 1 is 1. 3 over 1 is 3. So the average rate of change is 3 y units per x unit. So that's our average rate of change. So we can find that. Now it says find the equation of the secant line between 1 and f of 1, this point, and 2, f of 2. Well, how do we find the equation of a line? Well, the first thing we have to find is slope. Well, we've already done that. So we know slope. And now we can just essentially use any one of our points. Well, when x was 1, our function was 1. And when x was 2, our function was 4. So we can use any one of those points and use the equation we call point slope, because we have points and we know the slope. So I'm just going to do it right here. y minus the y value. I'm going to choose y, this point right here. So my value is y minus 1 equals the slope times x minus the x value from my point is 1. And then we'll just do some simplif simplifying. Add 1 to both sides, y equals 3x minus 2. This is the equation of the secant line between the points 1, 1 and 2, 4. This has been section 3.3. Thank you for watching.